Welcome back. The Netherlands recently marked the 20th anniversary of its assisted dying law, where people can make advance requests for assisted death and can access it for reasons of mental illness, such as PTSD or depression. Given Canada is in the midst of a heated debate on these very issues, we reached out to Dr. Theo Bora, professor of healthcare ethics at the Protestant Theological University in the Netherlands, and a former member of the Dutch Euthanasia Review Committee. He is also a member of the first church worldwide to officially embrace euthanasia. Here's our conversation from earlier today. Dr. Bora, thank you for your time. Thank you. Here in Canada, the law was originally imagined as something for someone who had a terminal disease like cancer and is a month away from dying. But in the last few years, we've seen numerous expansions to the law, including the elimination of the criterion that death be reasonably foreseeable. And this opened the door to patients suffering solely from mental illnesses. Based on the experience of the Netherlands, how does this play out? Um, well, we started out just like Canada and the US and, and other uh, uh, jurisdictions like um, uh, advocating euthanasia for people who are very close to a natural death. Uh, so the, the main reason why people what wanted to die was that they are afraid of a terrible death. And what we now see in an in increasing number of cases, and, and my estimation is that it is about 15 or 20% of all cases, that is that patients are not afraid of a terrible death. Uh, they are afraid of terrible life, a terrible living on. So that's that has to do with, with dementia, it has to do with, with chronic illnesses, it has to do with handicaps, and of course it has to do with psychiatric illnesses because these people have, have a long lifespan to live and 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 that that makes a very miserable view of the future. The thing about accessing MAID is you need to be of sound mind in order to give consent. But how can that be said of somebody who is suffering from some of these conditions, major depression, for example? Yes, that that is the the, the foremost uh, objection against euthanasia in psychiatry in my country. Still, we we have a, an increasing number of psychiatric patients having euthanasia and there's one thing and that is yes of course you may be depressed and this depression may affect your your mental competence uh, so there's some extra uh, safeguards in, in in place such as that you must have two or three psychiatrists uh, making sure that you know what you're asking uh, and of course the second uh, big problem is how can you ever be sure that a psychiatric patient will not have a prospect of improvement? Because I have seen people suffering terribly and they kind of, at some point in their lives, they got back on the dry side again. Um, what I think is, is the most important difficulty here is uh, is not the mental competence. It is the fact that people, and I know several of them, that people uh, who have psychiatric illnesses, they feel kind of abandoned by by the uh, psychiatric um, profession. Uh, because if, if psychiatrists provide euthanasia to them, it means that you're utterly hopeless. Uh, and that is precisely what may aggravate their psychiatric condition. Canada is also contemplating made by advance request, which is in stark terms, it means that doctors can basically end a patient's life at a time when they may be completely unaware. And part of the reason this has yet to be legalized, Dr. Bohr, is because of that very issue around consent. Well, we had a groundbreaking court case in, in 2070 through 20, uh, and that was the so-called coffee case. That was a, a lady, an elderly lady, who was suffering from advanced dementia. And she had an advance directive saying that if I no longer recognize my children and if I have am incontinent, etc., I want you to to euthanize me. Now she she got into that position, uh, but at that moment she no longer uh, was able to affirm her uh, her wish to die. Still, they killed her because at the at at the the end of the road, the Supreme Court said that the. The, uh, the wish of the lady that she once was trumps the, the wish of the lady that she had become. But one of the details, and that's a tragic detail, is that at the day of her death, she suggested that they would, would go out for dinner and, at the, uh, and, and actually she resisted being euthanized and the children had to help the doctor to fix her and fixate her and euthanize her. So that was a tragic event. And, and the most astonishing thing is that the Supreme Court said that 
this was the right decision and 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 the supreme court actually said uh, we would uh, we would advise the doctor to put a very very strong sedative in the coffee or in the yogurt so that the person the patient in place does not have the opportunity to resist I imagine there would have been a number of doctors who might have been uncomfortable in a situation like that, wouldn't you think? I mean, how do you find that balance between yes. the pressure that is put on a doctor and an individual's will before they lose the ability to give consent legally? That is a pivotal question, really, because uh, I think the, the the number of doctors in the Netherlands that will be ready to euthanize a person who no longer knows that what what is going on those doctors can probably be counted on the on the hands of the fingers of two hands so so there is an enormous gap between the public opinion i think i don't know exactly the numbers but probably 20 or 30 percent of the people would say yes i would make an advanced directive and i would want my doctor to act on the basis of that directive but between that public opinion and between the doctor's preparedness to perform euthanasia, there is an enormous gap. Surveys do show that a majority of Canadians want the right to plan ahead. And I'm going to hit you with a question that is often raised in these discussions, and that is, if somebody else decides to die, what business is it yours? Isn't this the ultimate expression of freedom of choice? Yes, in a way. But, you know, I, I think uh, decisions to, to have yourself killed, I, I think I'm a very big supporter of the individual autonomy rights. So I think that the government or nobody else has the right to interfere, intervene when I want to kill myself. Where I start the pro where I think the problem starts is where society starts to, to, to facilitate um, and offer this possibility. For example, we now have a law in the making that offers any person over 74 years old to have assisted suicide, no matter what your condition is, even if you're healthy. Uh, that yes, that is a right of the individual. But on the same on on the same uh, bill, it means that people are kind of discriminated. That we can live without you. We can we can do without you. We offer it to you. And I think that is the 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 paradox of of assisted su su suicide in this case, really. Wow, that there would be the definition of a slippery slope. Yes, actually, it would. Yes. All right, Dr. Bohr, we'll have to leave it there. We thank you for your time. Thank you. And we'll get reaction from our panel when we return.